you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for making the trip today to be here together. Space sustainability is something that I'm passionate about, and I know you are too. And I can feel the energy in the room. It's really great. The Secure World Foundation, I want to thank them. Uh, they have long been a leading voice in the importance of space sustainability, ensuring that we can come together and find common ground in how to preserve the space environment. Also, a thank you to the cabinet and the uh, government of Japan for co-hosting. Uh, Japan has long demonstrated its leadership in space sustainability, so thank you to our wonderful partner for that. You probably recognize this slide. I do talk about why we go a lot. As I'm sure you heard yesterday and very well know, the space environment is incredibly busy and getting busier. I was reflecting this morning and I challenge you all to reflect on the amazing changes that have happened in the last decade to two decades, but mostly I would say the last decade in our space environment. It's extraordinary, the achievements. If you take a snapshot of where space was, for example, in 2010 and where we are today, it's really visible. New entrants, new capabilities uh, for both human space flight, but also in commercial. It's incredible. And that's because people are seeing the value. More nations, more companies, they understand the value, the unique value proposition of space starting, of course, with science, the science that we can only do, the science of studying our Earth, studying the solar system, su studying the cosmos, can only happen in a very unique way from space. But in addition to that, what we're seeing is the unfolding economic benefits that are also coming from space. Some of those uh, incredible things that happen when you invest in national, technical, and scientific capabilities that spin off into so many other ways. They see that the opportunity for new partnerships and an elevated status on the world stage. And then of course, seeing people of all ages being inspired by these new capabilities and the desire to get involved and leverage those capabilities and build new partnerships and go into STEM activities, which is just part of the virtuous cycle of what we're trying to build. So this is awesome, right? It's great. I think we're really at the very beginning of this revolution. But what it means is that we have some very unique challenges. Just like we see increases here on Earth from urban sprawl, for example, uh, that create chaotic conditions here on Earth that we're worried about, more people going to space means more space traffic as well. More opportunity for traffic jams, near misses, more opportunities for collisions, for debris that can wreak havoc in our environment. We have got to deal with this now. It's absolutely critical that we do that. We must learn from the lessons of the past, the way we didn't always preserve the environment here on Earth. We weren't thinking that way. We weren't seeing the consequences of our actions. It's absolutely critical that we come together now. And that's why I thank you all for being here today to talk about it because we want to make sure everybody can reap the value of space going forward. So in addition, uh, I just want to say that I've been a little concerned about this for a while because I think we're all concerned, but I've been asking why are we not making more progress on this? I think we have seen enormous progress. Certainly we're talking about it. There's a massive engagement on the part of industry, but also academia, which I love. Uh, doing analysis, uh, governments are coming together around this. Um, you can really see that by the representation here um, at this conference. NASA, uh, I was concerned, we didn't have clarity around how we could contribute and where our voice fit. As a deeply technical organization, that's where I was focused. And so uh, we also needed a whole of agency strategy. We had a lot of people working scientific and technical, like different aspects, different lenses of the problem. And so uh, uh, then Associate Administrator Bob Cabana and I uh, put together a cross-agency group 
um, safety and mission assurance, the chief engineer, office of technology policy and strategy, our science, space technology, and space operations mission directorates. So we formed the Space Environmental Sustainability Advisory Board and asked them to set up a tiger team to really articulate the challenge. That was my, my challenge to them at first. Why is this so hard? Why are we having so much trouble making progress when you can feel how much people want to make a difference? So also to take a close look at how NASA could really help the community with our unique capabilities. So many people are making incredible progress in different areas, but what is it that NASA could uniquely bring to the table to support that? We really needed to leverage all of our smart people, not just in operations and in science, but also in technology and policy as well. So uh, we started with an articulation of our goals about why this is hard. Let's see if I got that. There we go. And what NASA as a global leader can do about it. And identif identifying those challenges made setting the goals much easier for us. So I'm just going to run down our goals briefly. I, I did announce this earlier this year, so, uh, but I'd like to reiterate why they're important. I think first and most critically, we just really need to converge on a widely accepted framework for assessing space sustainability. Just as NASA was looking at this through various parts of the organization with different lenses, so have we too been each studying different aspects of this problem. Different people have access to different models, we're talking space situational awareness, reentry survivability, debris risks, space weather, economic drivers, et cetera, et cetera. So by collaborating with domestic and our international stakeholders, we're aiming to, to establish a shared perspective that looks through all of those lenses in a holistic way, which will then enable us to create a consistent set of parameters and metrics we can use that framework to understand the effect of not just turning one knob of the dial, but turning multiple in different ways and seeing how we can get convergence around actions that when working together are greater than the, the uh, sum of their parts. So since April, we've been surveying recent frameworks. We've been gathering uh, and collecting information on metrics and models that many of you have helped develop. Um, we've conducted reviews for similar frameworks of an incredibly complex environment that are used in earth sciences and heliophysics and other areas to understand and simulate these highly complex environments. The team is also using different modeling techniques and exploring some exciting new technologies such as universal model language to understand how all the different entities are interconnected. Everything from computer codes to ground systems to breakup models, you name it. Uh, we're developing use case diagrams that will help us exercise this framework and make sure that we're adequately covering uh, all of the requirements that we're hoping to get. We expect this draft, this first draft, which we will then, of course, be able to go out to our partners for consultation and get input uh, because and those of you who know me know that I always think that even if we get our story straight around any strategy, we need to have a consultation period because uh, together with the, the value is to bring all of the wealth of knowledge that this whole community has. So we'll, we'll start by pulling things together, but then we will be going through a consultation mode. So we have not just been doing that. We have not just been sitting in that one area. There's a lot of other pieces to this we've been working on. We've been focused on the uncertainty analysis of the probabil probability of collision metric. We started a gap analysis of our own internal uh, conjunction assessment risk analysis or CARA program to see if there are places that we're not covering. Uh, we've solicited ideas from our workforce. Just overall, is there anything interesting that we can do to design more sustainable missions? And we have released the second phase of a report on the economics-based approach to quantifying risk to satellite operations from managing the risks posed by uh, existing debris. Again, just one lens, but it's a new one that, that hasn't been focused on very much. So big shout out to our Office of Technology Policy and Strategy, and I can see that Ellen is here, the deputy. Uh, so thank you for doing that. 
So uh, in addition to those, uh, that uncertainty assessment and taking a look at those things, our third goal leverages insights from goals one and two to create an investment portfolio. And uh, that's going to be really important uh, going forward. But I will also tell you that I'm really focused on having a good transition plan. We need to make sure that we understand exactly who our partner is and how they will be using the technologies, the models, the frameworks. Everything that we do has to have a transition partner. Uh, we have to understand that this isn't just something that we're going to do in an ivory tower. We have to make sure that we understand how it will be used. And since April, we've completed a priorities review in conjunction with our Space Technology Mission Directorate new technology shortfall analysis to make sure that there's lots of overlap and analysis with that. I, I expect that our investments are going to include a lot of early stage orbital debris management, enhanced space situational awareness, traffic coordination, and of course, environmental understanding. So these three goals are a pretty solid foundation, I think, for the technical uh, aspects that we'd like to do going forward. But goal four focuses on updating and developing policies to promote space sustainability. Internally, we revised our own debris remediation policy to loosen constraints on funding technology development. And likewise, even though we're not a regulatory agency, our partners, I think the Department of Commerce was here yesterday, uh, and uh, the Department of Transportation as well, we can leverage that scientific and technical expertise to help our regulatory partners with uh, their policy and uh, regulatory technical matters. It's a very proactive approach, and it also actually aids international deliberations on orbital debris mitigation. So uh, with that, we consult closely with our partners in the State Department. So we've talked about U.S. government, uh, but uh, also about the international community. But goal number five is actually uh, an inherently global issue that we need to bring together. And recognizing this, we have got to foster collaboration throughout the domestic and international uh, relationship uh, community to protect that space environment. So we'll be sharing a lot and focusing heavily on academia, industry, interagency partners, and our international space partners to ensure that we have a shared vision and understanding and that we're consulting and that, that we're working together in harmony. And really, folks, that's why it was so important for me to be here today. I think uh, we're not going to make progress on this. This is a classic global problem. That's one of the reasons it's been so hard. So for me to be here in Tokyo uh, to lean in with our international partners is really important. We're actually making some progress. Uh, we just announced the strategy in April, but I'm pretty proud of what we've done so far. I'm very excited about uh, this framework and the draft framework that we hope to have in November. But um, this kind of brings the sixth goal up. I did mention that we had six goals. So <laughs> one of them is about organizing ourselves for success. I talked about how we had these disparate parts of the agency working on pieces of the problem. So we pulled on those offices and mission directorates to come together to help with the strategy, but our responsibilities are still spread out through the agency. So we'll be working to integrate our activities under a director of space sustainability who will coordinate all of these activities and will be responsible for making progress for this strategy as the single point of contact. And that's really a priority focus for us uh, in addition to goal one for the remainder of the year. So I'm happy to say that we just appointed uh, a temporary executive, Trudy Cordes, from our Space Technology Mission Directorate. She's just going to help take those initial steps while we're going through a very broad search. Uh, and we've had great interest in this from inside and outside the agency for the permanent position. So a special thank you to Trudy, uh, who has a little bit of a background in some of these areas. And so she's going to help us get organized inside the agency. Looking ahead, we still have a lot of work to do. We have to continue to work on the framework. We've got um, organizational success. We kicked off the development for volume two, cislunar. Uh, we had to decide what our next tackle uh, problem we were going to tackle, and it's cislunar space. We expect to have the challenges for that identified uh, 
in at somewhere in August. It just kicked off about a month ago. There's a lot of unknowns, and I think that's probably one of the things that's hardest about cislunar. Unlike the well-studied Earth environment, there's a lot that we're still wrestling with. But as we move forward, our commitment is unwavering, and together we'd like to, with you, shape a future for space sustainability that we can have a shared understanding of the outcomes of our actions and actually reap the rewards as quickly as possible. So thank you for supporting that and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Deputy Administrator. Uh, very, Thanks, Ian. Uh, very much appreciate NASA's leadership on this on this issue set to kind of have a more holistic approach across um, our ecosystem for, for these issues. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to ask you uh, just kind of uh, one that, that came to mind here at the end. Um, so obviously, one of the other large initiatives that NASA has been leading over the last period of years has been the Artemis Accords. And I was just kind of curious if you could talk a little bit more about the connection between the Accords, which have some sustainability principles embedded them as, in them as well, and they move towards the sizzlinger part of Volume 2. Well, I think the, uh, the Artemis Accords are absolutely a part of this. In fact, uh, <laughs> if you asked me, <laughs> I could probably map out the interconnections between all of our strategies, uh, which we have, the Moon to Mars strategy, Artemis Accords, now the Space Sustainability Strategy. The goal is that our strategies are consistent and coherent, and they're amplifying for each other, and yet um, there's, there's clarity and then responsibility for execution. So obviously the Artemis Accords, again, I, I go back to the fact that we all want this so badly, right? It's, it's an easy part of the Artemis Accords. One of the things that we're doing with the Artemis Accords that I think is gonna be helpful is we are talking about what does non-interference really mean and what does space sustainability really mean? And, and beginning to have those discussions and to take some baby steps in the right direction. But that consultation will directly feed into the cislunar volume for sure. All right, thank you. So um, we actually don't have another question here, so I'm gonna try and uh, add one more myself. So uh, very much looking forward to the, the permanent post uh, being announced. I think great interest in the community for that. Um, you mentioned that will be the point of contact uh, for this community to, to, to come in. Um, if I may ask, what will that look like? Is it going to be an open consultation process? Is it going to be calls for input for the community? Or are you going to be out at forums like this, kind of all of the above? Yeah. Well, we do a lot of consultation. So those of you who are familiar, for example, with our Moon to Mars strategy and the, and the approach that we took with that will certainly take uh, a note from that playbook. There will be workshops. Uh, but we've also found that sometimes smaller forums like roundtables can actually be really, really helpful. Uh, so I think what we'll take a very targeted approach uh, using all the resources available um, to you know, have those kinds of consultations. Clearly, there will be an opportunity for public comment as well. All right. Well, Deputy Administrator Melroy, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for your leadership. And I think we uh, have a panel on SSA coming up after this. Great. So we'll follow thank right you, on thematically. Yep. And thanks for your commitment. Yep.